to thank Dr. Allen uh, and Allen Interactions for uh, participating and partnering the Tech Learn Conference. Michael, anything else you wanted to add about the like pre-conference sessions, anything like that? Well, as as many of you know, uh, my regard for Ethan Edwards couldn't be higher. Uh, he is a brilliant instructional strategist and. I get so many letters and calls and text messages from people who have attended presentations and workshops that he's done. It's, it, I feel like it's a real privilege to learn from him. Uh, and we've, we've worked together for, oh, I don't know, it's well over 25 years. And uh, I, I still feel like I learn every time I'm uh, listening to him. And he is doing a, a two-day pre-conference a session on interactivity and learning uh, and I I'd encourage anybody who can get in while there are still seats available to get in that session it'll it'll be terrific you know, Ethan has done a number of webinars uh, for Training Magazine Network, and uh, and I couldn't have higher regard for him either. We've just always appreciated uh, having him here. And, okay, so we better uh, move on. And uh, so again, our session today, Why E-Learning Fails and Pathways to Measurable Success, sponsored by Allen Interactions. And again, uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Michael Allen. Michael, welcome back to Training Magazine Network. Thanks so much, Gary. I really appreciate it. All right, so interesting in that our group here isn't primarily motivated by reducing training costs. And yet, you know, a lot of the decisions that I see organizations make are, have to be explained by wanting to cut training costs, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and that's a problem uh, in that if you want to be more competitive and you want uh, higher productivity and so forth, cutting training costs is probably not the way to get there. And so uh, today's uh, audience probably sees that really, really well. So designing high-impact learning experiences, all right, I will certainly talk about that. And motivating and engaging learners, that's a really great topic. I'd like to spend the whole hour on, on motivation, but I, I do have some presentations on that. We'll catch a little bit of that today, if I can. Delivering, scheduling, managing, yep, we'll talk about that for sure. And that, la that first one, lack of my organization's interest in ROI, isn't that a killer? All right, let's go for that. So I think uh, let's, let's go to the... Uh, just get into the slides here. Yes. Okay. So there we go. So now we got things. We got things working. So again, thanks. Thanks to uh, some of the our, our clients I've had a chance to work with that were registered last week, and a special welcome to new people that I haven't had a chance to work with and, and talk with. And we have already scheduled those. So one of the things that I'm interested in is what you think is the most important benefit to. Uh, e-learning and maybe we can just put those comments at the chat as, as we go forward so I can move ahead or there is a window for it. Okay, that's good. So, big question is what is success for an organization, for an individual? What are we really striving to do? I think we can agree that we all have a goal of success and we might think because we all define that goal in different ways that it takes something different to achieve our successes, but I'd argue that that's not really, really the case. That, in fact, success is doing the right things at the right time. Almost every success, if not every success, comes from doing the right thing at the right time. Uh, whether it's uh, choosing to what to eat, choosing what to say, choosing what to buy, choosing what to sell, you know, Almost everything comes from doing the right thing at the right time. And gosh, what is training all about? But helping people prepare and then motivating people to actually do the right thing at, at the right time. The interesting thing that correlates with this is that nobody really cares what you know. They really don't. They really only care what you do. They really care a lot about what you do. So we make the assumption very often that if people know certain things, they will logically do the things that we want them to do. That's a bad assumption. That's a bad assumption. 
people don't. People will know that they ought not to do something that they do all the time, you know. So breaking habits is tough, uh, and adapting new behavior patterns is certainly a big challenge here. But why does training focus so much on presenting information then, you know? Because that just really isn't going to do the job. But historically, that's what training and education has all been about, is about presenting information, organizing the content, scoping the content. And I want to tell you, I don't think it's about that, you know? That has to be done as part of developing training. And if you look, if you look at what most people do, they start with the content. They figure out, I've got to develop some training, so I'm going to start with the content. I think that's the wrong place to start. The first place to start is, what do we want people doing? The things that matter, that are, that are valuable. And then what experiences would tend to get them to do those things? It's just a, a really, really different perspective, I think. So focusing on the information really misses the business perspective. But what's the model that most people use? I call it the tell and test model, where you start telling your students something. Now, tell is just a, you know, a general word for a presentation of information, whether it's done through a video, whether it's done in person, whether it's done through text, whether it's done through bullet-pointed slides. However, that's telling uh, for me. And then we test them and often use the test as a motivation for you should be paying attention to this stuff, whether you're interested in it or not, whether you can see it being a value to you or not, and so forth. And then Often we give them a grade, you know, so it could be an ABC or a pass-fail or you attended and so you get a certificate, you know, or a percent correct and so forth. And then eventually the time is up and we've done our job, right? Well, the sad thing is this is an extraordinary compromised model. It's compromised primarily because of the convenience of delivery, really. It, you know, you can fit it into a time slot. Uh, everybody starts and finishes at the same time, potentially. That's nice uh, for coordination, so it's just neat and manageable. It doesn't really expect all learners to reach full proficiency because when the time's up, the time's up. And so some people will have done well and some people will not, <laughs> and so forth. The worst thing about this model, I think, the very worst thing about this model is that it's boring. It's just boring, 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 boring. And often, because it's time-based, we're all looking for the time to expire because we, we want to get done. It, it, very often, it's passive. And we all know that if it's focused on getting you to be able to answer questions on a test, you know the next day after the test, you've lost most of what you've learned. And a week later, you can hardly remember anything that was on the test. And it's just, it's proven to be really, really, really ineffective thing is that this is what people do all the time. And even with e-learning technology, we still use this same model far too often. In fact, any use of it, in my view, I have an extreme view about this. It's like, don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. You know? And it's not necessary. It's not really, it's not really a cost factor. So it's too costly. It's really too expensive because of its ineffectiveness, uh, and, it, and it really doesn't work. So when people are bored, they're not paying attention, they're not focused. You can't learn people, you know, they have to do it themselves. If they're bored, their mind is somewhere else, thinking about something else, and, and they've gone, and they've, everybody's time is wasted. So what would we all prefer? I, I always think that the, the most important skill that an instructional designer needs to have is the ability to think from the perspective of a learner. What would you want as a learner? Stop thinking about all you've learned in, in instructional design classes about scoping and sequencing and analysis and so forth. All those things are important. But if you think from that perspective, you're thinking about something that's alien to the learner for whom you're building something. So think, what would I want? What would I really get a kick out of? What would help me? If you answer that question, it'll probably put you on, on the right path. In, in general, I think all of us would really like to have a personal mentor, 
I have somebody that sits right here beside me, and as I'm doing my job at any point that I'm thinking, I wonder how I should handle this, I'd like to turn somebody and say, help me. Help me do that. That would be, that'd be really cool. The only better thing is that they would just do it for me. But, <laughs> but learning, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a mentor or for somebody to, to help me. I want opportunities to practice, safe practice. I want opportunities to see how well I could do. And I want to see what happens when I don't do a good job. I want to see the consequences of my actions. Think how different that is from reading slide after slide after slide and answering questions. You know, I want to practice the thing that I'm going to be doing. Now, I'm going to know things. I'm going to learn things in that journey. But it's the practice and the performance. Even if I can't articulate why what I'm doing is the right thing to do, if I can perform well, I can get to success. I can get to that platform of success. So e-learning really provides a unique and practical way to do this. I thought it was opened up the world when, when, you know, when I went from a professor at the university teaching in classes to a chance to use the technology and provide these experiences, I realized I was giving my learners something that couldn't practically be done before this technology came around. So why isn't everybody doing this? Well, I'm going to list seven reasons to go through them, right, and some of how they come around them. But as I was putting this together, I had three reasons in mind. And then I thought of another one, four. And, and when I hit seven, I thought, i got to stop. But there are more. Let me assure you, there are more. <laughs> there are more reasons why people are doing this. So we need to be alert and uh, to be able to counter a number of these things. I, I appreciate Robin's comment about it. It's time-consuming and expensive to create e-learning software simulation, but it's often the only way we can teach our systems to employees. Yeah, right, yeah. So I want to take on this issue of cost right away because one of the problems that uh, and, and those of you who are executives and leaders, I hope you're really listening now, uh, is that organizations tend, because of legacy perspectives, is my view of it, to think of training as a cost. And costs we want to lower, just in general. We want to get our cost down so we get our margin up, more of our revenue in. But I think of it as a competitive investment that gives us advantages and so it's going to increase our margins, it's going to increase our revenues, it's going to decrease our mistakes, uh, it's going to increase our productivity and so forth. So it's an investment just like thinking of, of buying a new factory floor machine. You know, I want one that is reliable, you know, it works for me all the time. It takes little maintenance and and it works just perfectly and I can depend on it. Well, I don't think of uh, people as machines, but they are an investment. We want them performing reliably. I know that it's very interesting to, to see a CEO being served by his or her organization and finding that, that the representatives of the organization say things to clients that that CEO would never say, would never want to have said, you know, and so how do you get people to reliably do what you hope they will do in benefit of the organization? Well, it's good, good training. And good training means good experience. It doesn't mean good presentation of manuals and information. It means experience. That's how we form our beliefs that guide what we do, right? So. Here's how we kind of tend to look at it, and it's just a failing strategy that I see so many people take, and that's that they really want to get those development costs. You know, we're not talking about the training costs right away. We want to get the development costs. We don't want to let authors, we don't want to let instructional designers spend the time that they need to spend to define those learning experiences that are really going to have that impact. We want to minimize their time, minimize it so that the only thing they can do is present content. So we, we, we reduce the number of people that we have working on it. We try to reduce the time to develop it. And we squeeze that thing down to get these little bit of savings. 
and the gray area. And what happens is our costs go way up. Think about that. Our costs go up when you squeeze that, right? So we have additional costs. Training is less effective. It's going to, we're going to have to retrain people. It takes more time. We're going to have to patch up our weaknesses. And so we're going to have people having to uh, go to other workers and get mentored by other people who are maybe not performing particularly well either, and more time away from work and lack of confidence and, and proficiency. I see a little spacing problem there. Apologize for that. And, and people are bored, and they're going to avoid all the training they can because they hated the last training that they got. So this is a simple concept that in words, a lot of people don't get, and I decided, let me try to create a graphic that shows that, because this, this is the reality that's going out there, and that's why I love working with, with clients who are in a competitive situation, because we know if we give them the right kind of training, they're going to win in the marketplace, right? And so, number two, I got to go fast, I got a lot of them, as I mentioned, so number two is using the wrong instructional strategies. I see this happen all the time, all the time. So, oh, somebody asked about what's my definition of bored. I, something that does not keep your mind focused. It makes you feel like I would like to get out of here as soon as possible. It's not benefiting me. I don't know why this is value. I don't know why I have to take this training, and it doesn't make any sense to me. So the criteria always have to be, is it meaningful to the, each learner? Is it memorable? Will it stick and be able to guide their future behavior? And is it motivational that will move people from current behavior patterns to, to new ones? Okay. Using the wrong instructional strategies all the time, all the time. So I've also tried to simplify this in a graphic. <laughs> I'm mindful of what Einstein is said to have said, I think there's debate about it, but he says he's always trying to make these complicated concepts of physics as simple as possible, but not simpler. In other words, don't, don't get into an area where it's not really true, you know, keep it. So I'm always trying to do the same thing in our field. How can I make these concepts simpler? Well, anyway, I am, I'm going to suggest that there's three primary categories of outcomes we're looking for. The first one is that we really want people to be able to follow instructions. We've got a manual, we've got guidelines, whatever, and we're going to tell you what we want you to do, and we want you to follow those instructions. That's the simplest, simplest thing. So we've got to make sure you understand the instructions and can do it, right? Second is I want people to remember and follow those instructions. That is, I want them to internalize this information so when they're on the spot and performing, they won't have to go look things up. They're right there and they know what to do. As we always say, you know, when it's time to perform, it's too late to practice. Practice has to come before that, right? So we want people to be able to perform independently of performance aids. At the third level, we want people to perform expertly. No instructions. What do we mean by expertise? We mean by ex an expert can look at a situation that isn't exactly like anyone they've encountered before. It's not exactly like a situation that they've been taught to handle, but they're expert enough to be able to analyze that situation and figure out what would be the right response. Now, I think almost all training falls in these three categories, and, and I apologize if it's overly simplistic, but again, I, I think this represents a lot of our world. <laughs> and so what's the, what are the typical instructional strategies that I see performed out there? Well, for following instructions, I see people providing information. And that makes sense. And we often call that performance support. So we've got a manual, a checklist, a heads-up display or something. And you just need to do step three now, and then we'll go on to step four and so forth. So... I don't have any particular problem with that. But if I want somebody to remember and follow instructions, what do I see people doing out there? They typically provide more information. They saturate with, okay, here are more things to keep in mind. Here are more tricks to try to help you remember things and so forth. Uh, because we're so content focused. And third, if we want people to perform expertly, we seem to provide 
even, even more information. <laughs> or as Jim says, talk louder. <laughs> I got to put that on my slide. <laughs> talk louder. That's exactly, exactly right. Uh, so, yes, subject matter experts are always notorious for wanting to add more information because they think it's all about information. And again, it's not what people know, it's what they do uh, that we're responsible for. So what would be uh, a more effective approach? I'm going to give this to you in two layers of refinement. First, just basically following instructions, providing information, it's probably right. So. It's just that we keep doing that. <laughs> when we want people to be able to perform independently, there's nothing that works as well as practice. We want guided practice. That's what a mentor will do for you, is that they will try to find a challenge that will allow your skills to grow. They won't give you something that's way too simple for you and you can do it in your sleep, because that would be what? That would be a waste of your time, and that's irresponsible training, you know. So we have to find out where people are, then give them challenges that relate to that level of skill, and then keep moving those challenges up, get a little bit harder, uh, until we get, some, we get some proficiency. And finally, for expertise, uh, I'm going to come back to that comment about most training happens out, uh, outside the classroom uh, in a bit, because uh, that was a good comment too. Uh, perform expertly, what we really want to do is challenge and simulate, right? That's, that's the experience that we really, really want. And that's, we just don't get a chance to do that if our budget is squeezed down so tight that all we can do is provide the information, which means that people were going to have to go outside the classroom and other places to get the expertise they, they need, which may be misguided because the people that you are getting mentoring from don't really know how to do this as expertly as, as, they, as you could do it if you got the right training and so on. So I thought this was a pretty good guideline for people. And I've asked audiences in a number of comments to give me feedback. What do you think? Does this, does this really get it? And I got some really, really helpful insight. Uh, and part of it was that I'm missing something really important. And that's over at the left of the screen, if you notice. The nature of the task has something to do with this, and it sure does. That is, you would do different things if the performance of this task were risky or is really complex versus if it's really safe and it's not going to hurt you if you screw up, you know, or if it's really simple and, and people can get it with very, very little guidance. So taking those things into account, I thought, how am I going to modify this? Yeah, the context is really important. So, uh, well, even in following instructions, if you make a mistake in following the instructions, it could cut your finger off, you know, or it would make somebody sick, or, or you know, you lose a ton of money or whatever, you drive the car off the road then guided practice is really important here. And I'm going to show you a demo of a, a piece of, of courseware that uh, we'll give you a link to because I don't have enough time to give you a full demonstration, but you can get into it, and it's really, really cool. It's, it's about road safety, and in this case, uh, driving buses safely, and it's pretty fantastic. But you, you really need to have practice at those things, even if it's pretty simple and you can tape a guideline in front of you. Practice is really important, even there. And especially for remembering and following instructions, that's where we really, really, really need practice. But when it gets up into the area of being really risky and complex, then we probably need to do more simulation of it and really have you experience the full range of outcomes from really positive and valuable to disastrous on the other side so that you are so cautious and careful when you perform your task and you are double checking to make sure that you're doing it right. That really only comes from simulated situations where you see all of those possible outcomes and those will flash into your mind as you're performing. And finally, of course, 
it's still right that if you want people to perform expertly, then there's nothing like a range of challenges and simulated outcomes based on what you actually do. So we try not to use the wrong instructional approach, which is basically throwing content at people. Because that's not training. It is going to be learning in most cases. And, uh, and people will have to go elsewhere to get the, get the learning. There's a reason that people go outside the classroom to do a lot of their learning. It's because they're not getting it in the classroom, right? <laughs> so we can change that. Uh, third is not using the CCAF model. Now, some of you, I hope, are familiar with it. I, I've been sharing this for a long time. It, for me, it was an aha moment when I started trying to find what are the basic components of successful learning experiences. And I found that they are these four, context, challenge, activity, and feedback. Now, again, this could be a whole day that we could be talking about CCAF, and I'd love to have you go to our website or to our publications or our books. My adage here at the company, our studios, as you probably know, win just every award you can win in training. I'm so proud of them, and they do a really, really good job. And to some extent, they think, why isn't everybody doing this? Uh, because... It's almost, now if I say simple and any of my people are listening, they're just going to roll their eyes, you know, because there are a lot of challenges for sure, creating good training. But you can almost guarantee yourself success if you build on these four components, and that is you put your learners in a context that they can relate to, some situation they can relate to. Like I'm a new trainee at Target and I'm going to be in customer service, and so I say, okay, the context is you are at the exchange desk. And then I'm going to give you a challenge that you might face, which is somebody comes to you with a product that Target has never sold and wants to get a refund. What are you going to do? Now, just starting your training there, without all this introduction about the grand history of Target and how privileged you are to work in such a fine organization and a motivational message from the CEO, just start here. Put them in this situation and right away, they'll know that i got to pay attention to this because I have no idea what I'm going to do, right? That's when you're most awake is when you're faced with a challenge you don't know, you, you're not prepared for. Well, I throw that to learners at the very beginning because now they're really awake. And now they're wanting your help. What am I supposed to do here? So then we give people, oh, I could be uh, annotating these two. Sorry, I'm a little bit behind in my slides. We want to give them then an activity, some kind of gesture that says, here's how I would handle this. And the more authentic it can possibly be, the better. So it really feels like I remember actually doing this thing that I will do on the job. And finally, I want feedback. And I like feedback in consequences. So in this case, I would like the person leaving with that product they wanted to get a refund on, leaving Target, and appreciating Target even more than they did when they came in with it. Really thinking they got the right service, they weren't snubbed, they really appreciate whatever help that Target gave them, and they're coming back. Rather than, I hate Target, they wouldn't take this, I don't know what's wrong with them, you know, and I'm never coming back. But I would like to see the consequences, and I'd like to be able to play this situation several times. I'd like to see if I did everything wrong, what might happen? And see how mad I could make somebody. And I'd like to do it and see how happy I could make somebody. This is just, this is the fundamentals of great learning experiences. So CCAF, I feel like everybody should look at the work that they're doing. So here is a demo. Uh, again, I would like to show you all of this demo that I possibly could, but there is a link to it on alaninteractions.com. Our, our website, and this was developed for a, a terrific client, and there's an unbelievably large number of accidents at railroad crossings, whether it's a truck or a bus. Uh, in this case, the training is for bus drivers. My son is right here on his computer, and he is going to run a short segment of that uh, course. We don't have very much time, uh, but if you can. So we are about to begin... Uh, <laughs> our first route. And on this route there are going to be three railroad crossings and our job is to appropriately get us across that crossing 
um, without having an accident. And there's some great audio that goes with this. Let's see if I can't make that available. There's a bunch of things that we can do. We can control the speed of the bus. We can speed up. We can slow down. You can see that I'm coming to a railroad crossing, so I need to slow down as quickly as I can. We come to a stop. Um, you can certainly look and see if there's a train coming on either side by rocking and rolling. And when I feel like it's okay to go, I can speed up. You have successfully completed your first crossing. When you've finished reviewing how you've done, click continue to advance to the next crossing. So we can see I got a driver's report and while I was successful in crossing uh, this railroad track, we can see I didn't do all the things that I needed to do. So I'm getting a report card that says I, I did at least three things okay. Uh, and so now we'll, we'll continue. There's, there's very challenge here. I can turn off the radio. I certainly can ask the kids to be quiet. <laughs> and um, I don't know, crossing looks like it's a little ways away. I'll speed up. Uh, and start to slow down here again. Can open the door and open the windows. Oh, and there's the train going by. Tell the kids to be quiet again. <laughs> close the door and close my windows and, and be on my way. completed this crossing. When you're finished reviewing your score, click continue. Well, I'm getting, I'm getting better. And of course, we, we also want to show the consequences of, you know, what happens if you, if you don't cross appropriately. Um, so maybe I'll speed right through this, this crossing here. A sampling of, of what those challenges look like. Thanks, Chris. That's, it's you know as many times as I've seen this and played with it, I always want to do it again, and that's <laughs> a good example. There are uh, lots of uh, learning experiences that we've designed that you can hardly get enough of because you want to do it over and over and over again. And I, I think that's the example of unboring, just kind of the opposite of what it is. So you could play with that if you wish. Now, there, there, there's always the, the question like, we can't do this, right? Well, you, you have to. <laughs> you know, don't take that. Don't stay in that rut. You know, there are a lot of tools out there. It doesn't have to be animation-based. This one happens to be animation-based. But there, you can create a simulation-based learning with quite primitive tools if that's all you're stuck with. But why are you using primitive tools? You know, there are great tools out there. They are affordable. In fact, how can you afford not to use them? If you go back to that uh, slide that I had before where you're squeezing those development costs in order to pay exorbitant amounts for poor training, why would you do that? So, you know, uh, the training department should be flooded with every tool you could possibly use. And we as, as designers and developers need to learn those tools because it's a profession that we're in and, and, and we need to be able to do that. But I, do, I, do, I don't want to overstate that because um, although I'm, I'm very much opposed to using something like PowerPoint for training, you can create CCAF experiences even in PowerPoint. So I, I don't think it's quite fair in a way to, to blame the, tool, the tools. We have to build our own skills. Sorry to say that if it's a hard pill to swallow, but, you know, we're really responsible for the learner's time, and we need to create great learning experiences. Number four, and I have to rush here a little bit, number four is ignoring, is ignoring what we know about how humans learn. There's a lot uh, known about this, and some of my favorite references are here on the screen. If nothing else, get Make It Stick. Make, make It Stick is a summary of research written in a very readable form, and it tells you a list of things that 
These are things we feel quite certain are the case, and I'm going to show you some excerpts from that in a little bit. Uh, but Will Tallheimer's uh, work on uh, scientific research applicable to design e-learning and the smile sheets and Clark Quinn's misconceptions are really, really, really valuable. Um, a very new thing coming out, Clark Aldrich, who has been working for years to figure out how can we make short simulations really easy and affordable to build, the very question we're talking about here. His book isn't out yet, but I talked to him uh, just uh, a few days ago, and he gave me this link. He said, if you're going to if you're going to mention me, I'm going to I'm going to make a, a landing page for it, and I'm I'm going to share all this information for free with everybody. I said I'm like you at Allen Interactions. I don't keep any secrets. I share everything that I've figured out so far because I hope to keep figuring out more things, uh, and it's there. I had uh, uh, an honor to participate in writing the textbook on the right, uh, Trends and Issues in Instructional Design and Technology. It's a, a great book. It's used by a lot of universities and so forth, and it's got good stuff in it, too. We have a, a copy of the slides available for everybody here, and we'll, we'll be sending out more contact information so you can get uh, this list of references uh, if you didn't get it now. I'm going, to, I'm going to really kind of skip through these things. These are uh, principles that you will, will read about uh, in these materials, such as what we really need to do is trick people into spending the effort to learn, because learning is not effortless. But it can be fun. Effort and fun are not opposed to each other. In fact, games just show us we're willing to put a lot of effort into doing things, and we do it because it's fun. We're poor judges of what works for us and not, and so forth. So a whole bunch of things on, on the next list is this one that I think is so important, and that's trying to solve a problem before being taught how to solve that problem leads to better learning. And we try to do that with CCAF. You put that challenge up first, and then if people have trouble performing, which many will if this is new material, new training, then you help them solve that problem. Instead of the other way around, we're telling people, now listen to me carefully because you're going to need this information later, and people ask, well, why and when? Give them the why and when first, the challenge, and let them try to go for it, and if they can't get it, then help them. And there's a lot of research that says that's the right way. Allowing people to make mistakes and correct them leads to advanced learning and so forth. So too many of our designers have been thrown into this field without any background for it and yet this is a, a it's a profession that we're in here and you need to know these things you, you really really need to know these things so there are many sources of areas where you can get them the elearningmanifesto.org is a place to go to get some information and principles. You can sign up and endorse it if you think those principles are good. Please, please, please go look at elearningmanifesto.org. Really appreciate it. You will appreciate it if you did. The uh, Training Magazine Network provides a host of webinars and materials. We're really excited about the TechLearn conference, as we talked about. And this is just a little bit of a sneak announcement. It's preceding the grand announcement. But we've been working for some time on developing the Allen Academy because we just don't believe that the learning opportunities that are out there are really sufficient to help people become uh, professional in, in our field. And so we have four main colleges uh, in, in the academy. Uh, one of them is for CLOs and learning execs who really need to appreciate the ins and outs of things we're talking about here, but not at the level where they can do it. Instructional designers, practitioners, learning game design, and impact measurement are, are all things. And what we're particularly excited about is the first session of the Allen Academy is going to be held at the TechLearn conference at that time in New Orleans and so really excited about uh, getting all there so just keep an ear out for information about the Allen Academy uh, we'll be getting it to you soon but we hope to to really help everybody well oh, they went backwards gain those professional skills without having to get a PhD or, or a huge tuition debt uh, racked up Next is not being agile in design and development. We really do get stuck in procedures. I used to teach the ADDIE process for years and years and felt confident that it was right. 
I don't anymore. I, I, I really don't. Uh, I think that we, we really need a new process, a more agile-based process, if that term is meaningful to you. And uh, I, I encourage you to read about successive approximations over SAM. It's uh, an iterative process. It's a more fun process. And Karen says, Addy can be agile if it's done correctly. The problem with that is if you call it Addy and you're doing agile, I don't know what process you're using. Addy is no longer a definitive term in my view because everybody I talk to who says they use Addy, I ask them exactly what do you mean by Addy and they paint a new picture, a different picture because they're so, it's morphed into so many things, rightly. And as I say, if you're using a process that really works for you, gives you the quality product you want on time and schedule, it's manageable, then stick with it. Of course you should use it. But if it doesn't, there are other processes out there and uh, I really think that uh, a lot of us have gotten stuck with, with Addy and believe it's right. And I, it's not right or wrong. It's does it produce effectively what you want. For me, after years and years of using it, I found out that there's something better. And that has evolved into what we are currently calling the successive approximations model. Clearly, I can't go through that uh, today, but um, it, it really based primarily on looping through evaluation, design, and development in an iterative model, uh, which is really very different from anything you'll see in SAM. So, finally, underutilizing technology. We see this all the time. Do we, can we do this in two minutes? I think we can, right? Sure. I'd, I'd like to show you uh, one more demo. This is um, Mary Kay University. Uh, and, and here they have blended tools and learning. They blended video in a very effective way, and yet it gets you to the performance that you want. It doesn't just tell you about it, but it gets you there. So we'll spend just maybe a minute and a half now. Okay. So the, the first th to set the scene, the first thing that happens uh, when you sign up to become a Mary Kay Beauty Consultant is you get, uh, you get a welcome cat kit, uh, which includes some product and some explanation of what sort of resources and services Mary Kay will provide their independent beauty consultants to be successful. And wrapped together with that, that experience of getting the starter kit are some important things that um, really start to personalize and help you understand how Mary Kay can help you on your journey of becoming a successful uh, sales associate. And one of the more interesting things uh, about becoming a beauty consultant with Mary Kay is this is often the first sales job a person has had. And what they found was um, having materials that helped um, orient people with stories that sounded very much like the same position that they're in really could boost somebody's confidence that, yes, I can do this. And so it first starts with this questionnaire that that explores why are you doing this? Why are you becoming a beauty consultant? And as you start to answer these questions, uh, a list of really interesting videos of people who are in the same position that you're in are talking about why did they do it? And what were they feeling on these first steps? Um, and if you answer no and, and yes to some of these more questions, it completes a picture of people and women who are exactly like you. And it really does start to make it feel like, hey, I can be successful doing this. Mm -hmm. That rolls into an exercise where you're creating your story. So one of the, one of the things that's important when, when selling these cosmetics is people are going to ask you, you know, why are you doing this? And, and practicing and writing that why story, I think, is a strong, compelling component. And then you can share it, and you can read other people's stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the final segment of this short introduction is about creating a business plan. So Mary Kay will support you in creating a website, helping you buy products so that you can sell it right away. Um, and these first questions start to go through what, what sort of things can Mary Kay help you with? And that rolls into creating a complete business plan. So you might come down and say, you know, my budget that I can put towards becoming a consultant and, and selling product might, you know, might be a thousand dollars. And I can start to learn about you know, well, creating my own website. If I wanted to learn more about what Mary Kay has to offer there, I can see it starts for, you know, 30 bucks a month and I can visit and learn more about it. 
you know, I can say, oh, well, part of my budget is going to be, you know, 30 bucks a month to run my own website here to start being successful. It's three Thank you. So it, it blends the tools and everything. I know that we're out of time and we pretty much got through where we, we wanted to go. I have uh, just that final, uh, final list here that we went through. Oh, no, number seven, nobody cares. I do need to mention this. Nobody cares. <laughs> you would think nobody cares anyway because how few times the impact is, is studied from a training program. We don't have a closed loop to find out how well did it work, what was the impact, how much money did we save, how much money did we earn, how many errors did we prevent, and, and so forth. There's just no feedback. And that's just kind of silly, isn't it? <laughs> but it does suggest that nobody cares, which could account for why we tend to just throw out so much content at people, because that's the easiest thing to do, and if nobody cares otherwise, then we can really get uh, bonus marks for keeping the budget down and getting it done fast, right? So anyway, thank you, for uh, Gary, for popping up this question here uh, a little early, because I really do want to know what uh, takeaway was uh, for people today so that I'll, I'll know how to work more on improving my message and what we're sharing. I really appreciate this opportunity and so many people being with us today. So I uh, just thank you all. Michael, thank you so much, and also to the rest of the uh, Ellen Interactive team. It's been a great webinar. The, the list of, of learnings today is super long, and you see a lot of positive comments in the chat. I'm going to enlarge that list, and you can scroll down it if you like, uh, so you can see what everybody learned in the session. Also, I moved the, uh, the handouts over on the left there for those, well, Katina over on the left. <laughs> there, uh, so that answers your question. Don't miss uh, Michael and uh, and the whole conference at uh, training uh, twenty or Tech Learn, pardon me, twenty nineteen in New Orleans in September. And if you're not familiar with it, then um, then you can uh, easily find all the information about it by going to techlearnconference.com. And I'm going to I'll put that back up on the screen here in a in a second. I'll have a well, so that everybody can uh, click on that if you like. And Michael, we're just still live. If you had anything you wanted to add, well, I I might give a plug, and that's that we sure are available to help people, and we'd love people to come to our website, alleninteractions.com, and uh, or see us at uh, at uh, TechLearn. Any any way we can help, I I, I really am mission oriented and that is to improve learning experiences everywhere we can whether it's by sharing techniques that we've used or models that we know that work or, or showing examples of things that have been very successful or anything else we're very very open uh, and we're all in it together in a way and we just want to help great there is the slide again <laughs>